good evening, everyone. Uh, okay, uh, today we are here to talk about something that is really close to me because I love Postgres and I'd like to, uh, and I love Rust. So uh, I'd like to share my experience in what uh, we can do uh, combining the two. Um, let me start by uh, telling uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been uh, working as a software developer for uh, 20 something years. Um, and uh, I've discovered Rust only like three or four years ago. And that is one of my biggest regrets uh, because uh, after 20 years of uh, software development, it's something that uh, really empowers you. Um, and today we're uh, here to talk about uh, Postgres, um, which I really like because um, as we develop software and need to operate it, uh, at least uh, part of the time, uh, I really like boring technology, uh, technology that works, that is reliable, so the old dog in this, in this case. Um, and Postgres fits the, bit, the, the, fits the bill perfectly. Uh, it has been around quite a while, uh, is extremely uh, robust, mature, uh, well established, and it has a development process that favors stability and guarantees of uh, correctness rather than just chasing features, but is not uh, static uh, at all. Uh, it it uh, evolves and it uh, grows in feature set and so on. It's very easy to find people that uh, know and uh, are able to work on Postgres. It's one of the uh, most used uh, databases and it has a very mature community and so it fits I think is uh, one of the safest and most flexible choice that we have. Uh, not last for the fact that it is uh, open source and so we can look under the hood, understand what is going on, uh, which when you care about things actually working rather than just developing them uh, is a critical aspect. Uh, but the, the point that I want to discuss uh, at length this evening is uh, about its versatility. Um, because um, it already provides uh, a set of functionality that goes beyond uh, plain SQL to allow you to store structured data, uh, schemaless data, uh, and so can cover for uh, many cases where uh, in other cases you could go with a NoSQL solution. Uh, but the, 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 the important point tonight is uh, that it is extensible. Uh, it is extensible by uh, allowing us to develop extensions for it, uh, and uh, to do that in Rust, which uh, is kind of the thing today. So why you, you should care about extending Postgres? Uh, well, why you should care about Postgres, I think we covered that. But why should you uh, um, be looking at Postgres extensions? So uh, there are several reasons why I believe that uh, is uh, important. First of all, there is uh, the fact, uh, not in order of importance, let's say, but uh, there is uh, the fact that it allows us to be more expressive when, with the database code that we need to use. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use constructs that are specific uh, to every different domain. Uh, I'll, I'll bring a couple of examples that we will see later on, but uh, PostGIS uh, allows us to deal with uh, spatial data inside our database and allows us to do uh, and operate on constructs that are specific of the GIST domain. Um, it allows us to improve operability uh, by allowing us to write extensions that gather data that uh, is important for us to understand how the database is operating, uh, if uh, there are um, optimization opportunities, if there are bottlenecks and so on. Uh, I don't know. Uh, PG stat statements. Uh, does has anybody ever used PG stat statements? Okay, not many. Um, and so, extensions allow us to provide new, uh, to gather more data from the database. Uh, another important point is the fact that it allows us to process data more efficiently. Uh, we there are situations where we want to move the code the closer uh, that it is possible to the data itself. 
Um, we might want to change how the data is laid out uh, to fit uh, our needs, the need of our application for performance. Uh, and also we might want uh, to leverage how we, our, the, the type of data that we have, the way that we query our data so that our queries um, are executed in the most efficient way possible by using specific type of indexes, specific um, disk layouts, and so on. Two more points. Uh, simplify your architecture. There are a lot of cases where um, when we architect a, a system, we might look at different storage options for different types of data. Um, and that brings with it uh, a lot of challenges. Um, first of all, uh, having distributed transactions is basically uh, unfeasible in most cases. And so we need to uh, deal with uh, eventual consistency rather than having situations where we have compensating actions and so on. Uh, so as long as it is possible, uh, I like to keep one, uh, one solution uh, within the same transaction boundary. I'd like to be able to have just uh, a Postgres instance to deal with that. Uh, and by extending Postgres, a few more cases than just relational data can be dealt with it. Maybe suboptimally, but that might be acceptable uh, in the context of a specific project. Uh, and finally, to avoid the reinventing the wheel. So if you have uh, a platform that needs to query data, you might want to use SQL. And uh, Postgres extensions allow you to query your data using SQL, even if it's not Postgres data. And that's uh, one thing that we will explore in a bit. Among extensions that you might have um, heard or worked with, uh, we find uh, a few that are distributed with Postgres itself, which is PG stat statements, which allows us to track planning and execution statistics for uh, the database and allows us to like say, uh, give me the top 10 queries in the last period um, by execution time or number of executions or calculate the average execution time for this query and things like that. Uh, we have Postgres, we have already cited it. Uh, there's time scale that maybe uh, a few of you have heard of or used for storing time series data uh, within Postgres, and it's implemented just as a simple Postgres extension. So it doesn't reinvent uh, the whole storage layer. It just bolts a few functions and workers and um, facilities on top of Postgres to allow to, to work with time, se time series data. And then we have others that we might go into more detail later. So very quickly, uh, what, which are the extension points that Postgres provides us? So we have uh, a lot of them, starting from, from the very bottom. We have the ability of using UDFs, so user-defined functions. Um, and they allow us basically to create SQL functions that we can call within our queries. Uh, these can be authored in various ways and then can be used in different contexts. Uh, let's say that we can create functions to use in queries, we can create uh, procedures, we can create um, code that runs uh, on triggers. So on insert, on update, on delete, on our uh, rows in the database and uh, do custom validation, do data transformation and so on. We can have custom types. We uh, mentioned POSGIS and the um, spatial types that it provides. But we can create our own, and so we can create, this is a very mm, trivial example. Uh, we can create a color type defined as a, um, as a tuple. Uh, we can uh, create subtypes of existing POSGIS types, such as creating a zip code, which is just uh, a text string uh, of five digits or something like that. And that will allow us to catch uh, bad data earlier, for example. And the same uh, can be done to create uh, aggregates, operators, operator uh, classes and families, and, and a lot of other uh, things that uh, can be used within uh, the database uh, engine. 
Then we have procedural languages. So we said that UDFs can be authored, uh, user defined functions can be authored in different uh, languages. Uh, <laughs> Pearl here. Um, there are a few that are already available and distributed as part of um, Postgres, and more can be added on top. Uh, we can author uh, functions in SQL, in Python, in Perl, uh, and now we can also author uh, functions in Rust, uh, which then uh, run within the context uh, as any other uh, function. But we can also implement a new uh, language. So we might decide that we want to do PLPHP, uh, and so write uh, in C or in Rust, write uh, an extension that allows us to use PHP for, for uh, user-defined functions. I would not advise to do that, but. Um, going to more interesting things, we can uh, create uh, access methods. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a problem with the slides, but okay. Uh, so this is not index access methods, this is access methods. So we can have index access methods that basically allows us to create custom index types for our data. So let's say you want to create uh, Bloom index filters, uh, Bloom filter indexes. Uh, you want to create, I don't know, this is a real example, uh, using Elasticsearch as a full text search engine, as, uh, as an index on Postgres data. And so when we are doing uh, a query, we are querying um, Elasticsearch and then fetching the matching rows from Postgres transparently. Rather than um, we might want to use a different storage uh, methodology, so change the table access method that allows us to change how Postgres stores our information and allows us, for example, to use columnar storage which is uh, extremely useful in the case that, uh, when, when we are doing analytical uh, query processing or um, when we have repeating data that can be uh, run, length, run length encoded and stuff like that. Uh, and finally, we have foreign data wrappers. And foreign data wrappers are uh, an even more um, powerful feature from some points of view, because the uh, foreign data wrappers allow us to basically uh, create an interface for Postgres to query foreign data, any kind of data. So uh, this data might be stored in local files, it might be remote files, might be uh, a NoSQL no database uh, deployed remotely. It could be um, REST APIs, it could be a uh, proc file system, any, anything goes. Um, and it allows us to basically um, implement an interface uh, that allows us to have read and write access to the data. And so we can implement select star from remote source and to do update and delete on the remote source. Uh, and it has most of the functionality that uh, the internal query engine of Postgres has, including doing parallel scan support and so leveraging um, multi-core architectures uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And there are many more that we can do. We can create background workers that do stuff in the background and do data consolidation, uh, data validation in the background. We can create new SQL command. Uh, we can modify the planner uh, to change the strategies that are used and so on. These extensions are um, packaged as folders um, that include a few things, some SQL scripts that create the SQL objects that we will be using. Um, these extension uh, and, and code in various forms. Um, these extensions then can be uh, added to a database uh, by using create extension name of extension. Uh, and Postgres provides a good enough, let's say, uh, lifecycle support to be able to update the extensions when a new version uh, is released and to apply migration scripts and to do that transactionally. Uh, and so uh, let's say that it covers most of the operations part of dealing with uh, extensions, updates, and so on. 
So how do we author extensions? Um, we can use a combination of languages. Uh, the common uh, in all cases is SQL because uh, to create the SQL constructs that will map to our code, we will be using SQL in any case. And then we could use some of the procedural languages that we discussed before, or we might need to go to native code, which is uh, loaded dynamically uh, at runtime. Native code um, is unavoidable for most use cases. So if you're writing a foreign data wrapper, you m most probably want to use uh, native code. Um, if you want to create an index access method or similar, uh, you want to use native code. Uh, and here, uh, um, Postgres is developed in C. Uh, it is a very, very, very old code base. Um, and uh, it has um, some challenges in developing software to run within it. Uh, obviously, we have SQL in convention and uh, Postgres create, um, exposes uh, a series of macros that allow our functions uh, from our library uh, to be discovered as uh, Postgres functions. Once we are there and we have gone through all these hurdles, we have free access to all Postgres internals. So there is a perimeter of APIs that you are meant to use, but basically you can use anything. Uh, and you need to play by Postgres rules. Developing extensions in C, uh, from my experience, has not been fun at all. Uh, because obviously you have no runtime library to speak of. Uh, you have no uh, standard library, I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Um, you have no uh, memory safety, you have no um, guardrails to help you, to guide you. Uh, you go and reinvent the wheel all over again. You don't have abstraction, high level abstractions, you don't have generics, and so on and so forth. The abstractions level is very low, you have no composability, uh, the code is not expressive at all. Uh, and another thing that is very close to me is that uh, you have very lackluster tooling from my point of view. If you work with the cargo, uh, going back to make files and uh, working with Postgres extension build system, uh, not being able to manage dependencies easily uh, is really uh, annoying annoying and uh, inefficient, ineffective. Uh, so we have different uh, options for that. Um, to be able to develop these native extensions uh, not in C. Uh, I'm mentioning some of these just because they are there, but I'm not, mm, I'm not recommending them at all. So uh, there was a library which was called Multicorn to be able to write uh, foreign data wrappers, for example, in uh, Python by providing a set of bindings uh, between C code and Python and allow you, allowing you to create just foreign data wrappers. Uh, and uh, it's not active anymore, but um, let's say 10 years ago, there were probably several uh, foreign data wrappers developed, uh, mostly uh, toys, but uh, several data wrappers developed with that. Recently, there was AWS DLE, uh, which allows, um, create, solves an issue that we have on RDS, on, uh, on AWS, Amazon Cloud, uh, which is that um, when you go with RDS, you don't have access to the file system, so you don't uh, have any ability to deploy extensions, which need to be deployed as a set of files within uh, the, um, Postgres file system. Uh, and so uh, it's basically a Postgres extension that AWS provides that allows to load sub extensions, let's say. Uh, but um, for um, a security point of view, let's say that the perimeter of what you can do is basically nothing at this moment. Uh, but I believe that that probably will go somewhere uh, because obviously there is interest in having the ability to extend RDS uh, and uh, AWS can only um, provide their own packaging of common extensions uh, up to a point. 
there have been cases where someone has tried to build uh, Postgres extensions in C++, but let's say that, <laughs> let's forget about that. Uh, so, why Rust? Uh, this is basically useless with this public, so, uh, uh, with this um, audience. Uh, we want something that is safe and fast. Um, we want something that provides us with a high abstraction level that allows us to uh, enjoy composability, uh, that allows us to review the code and not become mad, uh, not something that uh, favors uh, expressiveness, uh, and that has top-notch tooling, and so that is why we're looking at this. And there have been, for a few years now, um, uh, initiatives where people have started trying to develop uh, Postgres extensions in Rust, but there are a, a lot of uh, things to overcome to get there. Uh, let me mention a few. So first of all, you don't have uh, bindings for Postgres functions. You need to generate those. Uh, and uh, the code base uh, of Postgres is very large, it's very complex. There are a lot of uh, gotchas here and there. Um, so uh, it's not just a matter of running BinGen and forgetting about that. It's quite more involved. Um, and the second hurdle that we might face is that um, Postgres uses metadata within the uh, library binary to understand which functions are meant to be imported as user-defined functions and uh, their um, metadata information as well. Uh, not, not only that, but there are a lot of other macros to do a lot of other stuff that extension writers need. And so we need to basically port all, all those macros uh, to, over to Rust and replace them with something. And then it gets worse because there is a fundamental memory model mismatch between Rust and Postgres. Postgres uses uh, something that makes perfect sense in its context, which is um, um, memory context abstraction, where we have a stack of memory contexts and um, at different points in time in, in the life cycle of a query, uh, new contexts are created. Uh, data is allocated within that context, and then the context is freed uh, by itself when, that con when we go out of that context. And that works very well unless you need to like mm, drop stuff and make sure that things are dropped when, uh, before, before memory gets deallocated. We need to make sure that, um, yeah, the structs are called and so on. Uh, so that is uh, a big problem. Uh, and um, we have a few things that help in that direction, but there's no uh, easy solution. There's nothing magic. You are trying to adapt two things that works that work fundamentally differently. And so uh, there is a little bit of attrition there. And then we have the uh, error handling. So Postgres uses um, force and wind, uh, long set jump, long jump. Uh, and basically, at uh, the beginning of the transaction, it sets uh, the, the position in the stack, and then uh, everything gets executed. And if a uh, fatal error occurs, then it just jumps back to the save point. Uh, and all the memory that was that had been allocated is basically forgotten about. It's uh, it's released, obviously, uh, but we don't have any way of uh, performing uh, the stack and win that we need to, to, to do when we handle panics in Rust. Um, for a, from a question of safety also, uh, we cannot allow um, Rust and win, uh, unwinds to propagate through a foreign function interface barrier and vice versa. So since Postgres will be calling us and we will be calling Postgres, we need to deal with the uh, mismatch in both directions. Uh, but there is something uh, that has been developed in the last three years and that basically survived after different initiatives died down and were uh, com converged in this, which is PGR PGRX. Uh, I, I might say PGX uh, tonight. Uh, it has changed name recently, so uh, it's the same thing. Uh, 
Uh, and it's a framework to develop um, extensions for Polkadot and Rust, and it takes uh, at heart the developer experience uh, of, of it all. So it makes sure that the process is as seamless as possible. It has been developed in open source by TCDI. Uh, I'm not uh, a developer of this. Uh, I'm a user of that and a minor, minor contributor. So um, my experience with it is that it has a very active, open and friendly community. And it does a really good job at bridging the gap between the two uh, technologies uh, in regard to all the points that we've seen before. So basically, it allows us to go on Rails and have a very uh, easy approach to it. Uh, it provides automatic mapping between Rust and PG types. So if your function returns a star, a static star, a string, uh, that gets mapped automatically to Postgres text and vice versa. Uh, and the same is true for many, many common types that you might use in Rust and in Postgres with some friction uh, about the fact that uh, numbers uh, in Rust, uh, uh, yeah, th there is a bit of a friction, but in general, uh, the uh, numeric types change size because of silentness between the two platforms, but uh, it, uh, it's something that you can deal with. It provides macros to export Rust functions, so we just annotate uh, pl place uh, um, an attribute on our functions, and those get exported automatically. Uh, SQL is generated for them automatically, uh, and it takes care of calling convention, naming, uh, mangling, uh, generating metadata, and generating the SQL. It exposes Rust abstractions uh, over Postgres, and so we don't have to deal with uh, C-style functions to add an element to a list, get an element from a list, uh, iterate over a list, and so on, but I get a Rust wrapper that basically uh, allows me to do, uh, to work, uh, iterate, and all, all of that. Uh, it provides a few helpers to exchange memory with Postgres, and uh, tools like uh, the ability to register a callback to drop a value before the context is freed, because sometimes we need to allocate, in po we, we need to use Postgres allocated memory. Uh, and it provides also with uh, a few uh, macros, uh, the ability to uh, deal with the mismatch in unwind, and so basically it catches all the panics on the FFI barrier. Uh, and it uh, propagates a Postgres error by doing a long jump in Postgres and vice versa. When we are calling Postgres, uh, basically it does uh, the opposite thing. It sets uh, it's a jump, then calls Postgres uh, code, and if Postgres fails, it jumps back on the interface, and then that is propagated as a panic in Rust code. So it works in both directions. And also, it allows, it's on Rails, so if you just need to expose a new function, and we will see a brief demo now, uh, you can do that very quickly and very easily. Uh, but if you're doing something more involved, uh, you will probably find a place where PGRX hasn't already provided an abstraction, or maybe the abstraction that it provides is too simplistic for your use case. Uh, and then it allows us to uh, drop uh, to a lower level and have uh, more access, obviously, uh, leaving you dealing with a lot of unsafe there. Uh, but uh, the bindings uh, for all Postgres functions are exposed. You can add new ones. You can uh, create pull requests for new uh, endpoints that you need. Uh, and so basically allows us to work on both layers, high level and low level. And that, for me, is really important because as, uh, as you commit to a technology, at a certain point, you might find a place where uh, the platform is not there yet, and you want the ability to be able to go a little bit ahead by yourself, and then when the platform catches up, uh, you can sync back, uh, back to it. So this, from the point of view of you writing code for the extension, but uh, it does not stop there. So it extends cargo with PRG, PGRX, with the PGRX subcommon. So you have cargo PGRX that allows you to do everything that you would need 
to build an extension. So you download and install it, uh, and then you need Postgres. You need Postgres because you need to run Bingen against it, and you want to uh, run your extension within Postgres. And it allows you to download and compile multiple Postgres versions. Uh, it usually uh, supports the last three or five Postgres versions available. So now we are probably 11 to 16. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you go cargo pgx uh, install uh, and you install the latest build of a specific major postgres version uh, it allows you to create a project ar archetype that is basically uh, an empty extension that you can use to start it includes an idiomatic uh, rust test framework and so you can run your tests you can run your unit tests normally, and you can run your integration tests that are run from within Postgres. And the results are then uh, reported outside to Cargo. So in this way, you can do things like testing, select my function, uh, and checking that the results are what you expect. Uh, it allows you to go and deploy your extension locally for development and to package it and ship it out to, uh, I don't know, build a Docker container that you will use uh, to deploy Postgres. So uh, this is the part where probably most things will go wrong, so please bear with me. <laughs> so here we have uh, so we have Cargo PGRX. Uh, the screen, uh, I've zoomed in uh, to allow people in the back to see, be, uh, so it might be a little bit janky. Uh, so you have the ability to initialize the environment by downloading the different versions of Postgres that you will need. Uh, you have the ability to start and stop a Postgres instance, one or more Postgres instance, uh, instances that you will use during development. Uh, you can query the status, you can obviously uh, create a new project from an archetype uh, and you can uh, package for deployment or simply run locally. And fundamental test. So uh, an archetype is uh, pretty simple. We have cargo toml and we see here that we have a um, common boilerplate, we are building a CDILIB. Uh, we are enabling PG15 as the default feature. Uh, you can build for different Postgres versions because obviously different Postgres versions offer uh, different uh, functionality uh, from the ABI. Uh, you can import your dependencies, Taylor, all, all the rest, there's nothing uh, particularly significant. It creates uh, a control file, which is basically metadata for your extension, and it tells, and tells Postgres uh, um, um, yeah, uh, which, which is the version, uh, the current version of the extension, uh, where to find it, uh, and a lot of other stuff that uh, you can then tweak uh, that enables your extension to do different things. It creates a SQL uh, folder for you to include uh, additional SQL functions uh, and objects within your project. And then it creates uh, a, a libRS. And here we see a few uh, of the things that um, PGRX provides. So uh, it allows us to create, you, you have this macro which does magic, but basically it creates the uh, and exposes uh, as binary uh, data the Postgres metadata that uh, will be needed. Uh, you have a macro, pgextern, which basically marks a function for uh, exporting as a user-defined function, and this does all of the things that I mentioned before. So uh, it makes the function extern C, it makes sure that um, the uh, nomangle so the, the, the name is not mangled and can be seen by Postgres, create all the binary metadata that is used to, to distinguish it, and creates the SQL code that will be needed to deploy the function uh, when, when you're done. And so here we see that basically uh, I can import any crate at all, and I can use it directly, and so here we see a sample function uh, which uh, validates a fiscal code using a library that I found on crates.io. Uh, we take uh, stir uh, as input and Postgres will convert automatically for, from text-like types 
uh, within Postgres to our type. And then we can return a bool, and that is a Boolean for uh, Postgres. Uh, we can return static stars, and those will be made available uh, to Postgres as well. So here we are using another library and getting emojis. Uh, we can panic wherever we, we want, uh, and the panic will be propagated to Postgres and dealt with uh, as a SQL error. And so uh, we don't need to um, worry about um, unwind. We can create uh, set returning functions, and so have a function that returns a row set. Uh, in this case, we are returning a set of strings, and we do that by simply wrapping uh, a, ra a rust iterator within uh, a wrapper from PGRX that takes care of uh, convert between the Postgres representation for it uh, and our iterator. Rather than we can, re uh, th in this case, we are returning a, a set of values. Uh, here we can return a table-like uh, structure, so a row set, where we have multiple, uh, let's say, uh, multiple columns. So in this case, we have a code column, which is an option of static star, uh, and an emoji column, which is a static star. Uh, and here, again, we have a table iterator wrapper that will uh, wrap uh, our iterator and expose the data as a row set. We can create custom types. So in this case, I've created a URL type. Uh, the URL type takes serialize, uh, takes, I'm sorry, the URL type allows us to represent uh, a composite type in Postgres as a Rust type. Uh, and in this case, I want to be able to uh, customize the way that we parse from and to text. Uh, and so in this case, we are using the in-out fun funks macro, which uh, basically allows us then to implement the in-out funks trait for URL. Uh, and in this case, we need to provide a function that given a sister will return self, uh, which is a URL in this case. And we are doing some very crude parsing by myself. In, in it's just an example, uh, and uh, we uh, we can uh, we need also to provide an implementation that, given uh, our type, uh, will copy within uh, a Postgres object uh, our text representation, and then we can define uh, functions on our type. And so, in this case, we can call is secure given a URL, and Postgres will convert uh, the text representation of our URL in a Rust type, uh, and uh, we will be able to do something stupid like I did here, like checking if the URL is secure by looking if it ends with S, if the scheme ends with S. Finally, we see that we have the ability to write uh, tests. So in this case, uh, we have a mod test, and we can write these PG test annotated functions, uh, which can do assertions, as we usually do, and then ca they can call uh, our own functions. But we can also uh, use the SPY here. So uh, we can query, uh, well, sorry, uh, create a query. In this case, select is valid fiscal code and an example fiscal code, uh, and then assert that the uh, SPI will return a true value. And this goes through the entire uh, query processing of Postgres. So once we're here, we can do uh, cargo PGX run. Uh, and we are uh, in the Postgres instance that um, PGRX has created for us. Uh, and here we can create our extension uh, new tricks. And we can, uh, let's say, select uh, modify crab. Uh, rather than we can uh, select star from uh, uh, 
table emojis. And we have a table with two columns, code and emoji, and we can go then, and we can do anything that we can uh, with SQL, so we can like filter uh, and look for all the CRA, and any, anything like that. We could write um, aggregation functions and anything like that. Um, okay. And obviously, uh, I didn't mention here, and maybe we can go there, but only if time allows. Uh, obviously, the functions that I create, I can use them as triggers, for example. Uh, and so may maybe we can check this out. Uh, I'm sorry, I got fat finger syndrome. Okay, so. Let me, okay. So I can create a table users, which has a fiscal code field of type text, which has a check for is valid fiscal code. Uh, okay. Uh, relation users already exist, so um, bad idea to use users. Okay. Okay. So in this case, uh, new for relation, new row for relation as the violates check constraint as the uh, CF check, and the CF check is the one that we saw before. So uh, we, we can use these functions as any other function within Postgres. We can also develop uh, a for foreign data wrapper. Uh, and this, in this case, we have a foreign data wrapper that, uh, let me see, create extension EBSFEW, okay. Uh, I'm, my memory is very bad, so this, so here we will uh, create a foreign data wrapper, and so this has crashed. Nice, no problem. So, so uh, we have a little bit of boilerplate when we are basically telling uh, Postgres that we have a foreign data wrapper that we wrote in Rust and uh, we tell uh, it that we want to create a remote server in this case, which we call OPFA, uh, which, is a, which will use the foreign data wrapper EBS that we have just created. And it will tell you that we will be using region EU West 3. And then we will create a table, which is called EBS volumes, which has some fields that come from uh, EBS uh, volumes uh, that uses that server so that we can basically provide a schema for the remote data to be queried locally. Okay, so now if we look at the uh, mm, sorry did I no 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 I did not it's just that it's not a table it's a foreign table oh no I probably missed it yeah never never ne never argue with the audience <laughs> okay so this is it, a little bit better. So, so here we are querying AWS EBS API uh, and checking out um, volumes on EBS that are in the US 3 region on the account that I configured in my profile. Uh, and I can use this data as if it was a Postgres table and so I can say, let's say where type uh, equals GP2. 
uh, I can do aggregation. So um, let's say I can say, give me type count star as n uh, sum size as total size from EBS volumes. Um, yeah, maybe with a group by it works better. Group by type. Uh, and I can filter this data, let's say, where encrypted. Um, right now, if I uh, explain the query, uh, what I see is that uh, it's doing a hash aggregate to do grouping over a foreign scan on EBS volumes with a filter for encrypted. Uh, and we can say, if we do an explain analyze, which runs the query, does not only analyze it, uh, we can see that it basically fetches, returns three rows um, and that six rows were removed by our filter. So basically the foreign data wrapper has produced more rows uh, because it returned those that had encrypted equals false. Uh, and so they were filtered by Postgres. And a nice thing that we can do uh, is that we can uh, implement advanced functionality for our foreign data wrapper, such as performing the filtering at the source. So in this case, uh, I could ask uh, the uh, uh, EBS API to only return me those volumes that uh, are encrypted at the source without having uh, to download them just to filter them. Uh, and I can do that uh, if my ID collaborates, which is not a given today. So, so here, um, okay. So here basically uh, I'm in uh, the, okay. I'm implementing a function called begin scan, uh, which is called when I start a foreign scan uh, for Postgres. So Postgres called me and tells, uh, I want you to start the scan uh, like this, this and that. Uh, and PGRX mm -hmm. and another project mm -hmm. by Superbase, uh, which is called Wrappers, uh, basically uh, allows us to implement this in pure Rust uh, by extracting the information that we need to, uh, to do from Postgres structures. Uh, okay. And then we can do something with that. In this case, uh, Postgres will always apply our filters unless we tell it not to. And so we download all the EBS volumes, some are encrypted, some are not, and Postgres will filter them. But we can save Postgres time by filtering them at the source. And so in this case, I can make and take this function, which is called quals to filters, which basically uh, takes the Postgres filters, which are A equals B, uh, uh, encrypted equals true in this case, uh, and I can turn them in parameters for my uh, query to the ABS API. Uh, and if I do that and go back here, you'll now see that when I do this query, uh, you see that there is not uh, no uh, filtered rows anymore because the filtering is being performed uh, at the source. So uh, it's a sword, it's not a magic wand. So advanced use cases require deep knowledge of Postgres internals and that is something that takes a lot of time to do. Uh, but starting is extremely easy. So let's say that it is progressive you can immediately work with that. And then as your uh, requirements grew in complexity, uh, you can lean into that. Uh, there's still some unavoidable friction. Uh, there's no way to uh, map the two memory models uh, transparently. And that is probably the biggest issue. Uh, and uh, going fast requires quite a bit of unsafe code. So basically many data type transformations require going to strings and so on. Uh, and uh, doing that uh, involves copies, uh, but you can opt out of that by writing unsafe and just uh, performing uh, the operations that you need, the filtering that you need uh, 
uh, directly on the um, Postgres data structures. Um, moreover, Rust compilation is on the slow side and PGRX is very complex and need to run uh, a ton of bin gen magic on Postgres uh, 3. Uh, and there are a few rough edges. There, are, there have been a few cases where uh, you uh, of unsoundness. So you write safe code, but things go bad. But yeah, way, 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 way less than writing C, C code. So uh, to close, we use this. Um, we had a client with a distributed system, custom system for uh, storing and querying data. Uh, that had hundreds of terabytes of data uh, on a cluster, which was stored in a proprietary format, and they built a query engine on top of that. Some error from the past, mistake from the past. Uh, what we did was that we proposed to uh, replace this uh, proprietary query engine uh, with uh, a foreign data wrapper in Postgres, allowing them to query the data using SQL. Uh, as a measure to move towards a um, more uh, reasonable solution and to create a path uh, for migration. We used PGRX, quite advanced. We used things like parallel scan, so using uh, tens or hundreds of uh, processes in parallel to filter the data uh, that is part of a scan. This is supported by PGRX. We did predicate pushdown, and so what we have seen just now pushing the filtering in the Rust code before rows are yielded. Obviously, there's a trade-off between complexity and performance. So, there. Uh, we created Bloom filters to uh, pre-filter some of the data that we don't want to scan. Uh, we did brain range indices and so on. Excellent results. We did uh, 80 plus gigabytes per second uh, per node of uh, scan data on the, on the source. But the, the biggest win was uh, that it was way easier to uh, access the data and it was way easier to maintain the code base to add new uh, functionality uh, because now we can create SQL queries and then optimize for them rather than building everything from scratch. And uh, you always have the option of just doing a scan. It will be slow, but you can do anything that Postgres can do. Other things that we have seen done with Postgres, PGRX are... Uh, Automatic workloads injection to filter data by tenancy. So a guy used PGRX and said, okay, I have a multi-tenant platform and uh, I can uh, inject where tenant equals tenancy ID automatically in all the queries that are performed. And so uh, this allow, uh, allow them to uh, deal with, multi with the multi-tenant deployment rather than using Elasticsearch as Postgres index, which is the use case that brought PGRX uh, alive in the first place was built for that. So I'm done. I'm sorry about the uh, going a little bit long. Uh, Postgres is great because boring is uh, is good. Boring is enough. Uh, boring uh, being boring enough uh, is good because uh, you are dependable, but it's still flexible and versatile. SQL might not be a great query language, but it's probably better than what you and I might write uh, in a pinch. Uh, and if you need code close to the data, Rust is a good candidate and Postgres is too. So thank you very much. I hope to. <laughs> okay, we've got the time for one question, maybe. Yeah. It's yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, cool talk. Uh, just interested with that error handling. So you're talking about how we can just like panic and like powers that be will like turn that into stuff that um, Postgres is happy with. Uh, is there any support for like say returning like a more idiomatic like result type or something from your functions? So inside your your code, you can return uh, error and do idiomatic error handling. Uh, on the interface, uh, you you just panic and it gets propagated. Uh, I don't think there is any reason to do that. Uh, I think that returning an error, it's just the fact that the macros have, have been written this way. I think because it's the uh, it was the shortest way to handle also errors. But there's, there's, there's no reason why that cannot be done. 
Uh, and yeah, uh, probably a pull request would be very appreciated. Cool, thank you. Okay. So um, another brief reminder that the wardrobe is closing at 7 p.m. So uh, go there before 7 p.m. And um, yeah, thank you, Francesco. Francesco De Grassi. <laughs> if you got more, more questions, maybe you can ask them at uh, during the, the coffee break. Hmm? Uh, uh, so we'll see you in half an hour. Thank you.